1852. The arrival of a dynamic new High Commissioner, Sir Gerald Templer, has re-energized the War on Terror. Spearheading the battle will be Malaya's intelligence service, Special Branch. General Templer had a background uh, in intelligence, and he knew that uh, in a counterinsurgency campaign, uh, you needed good intelligence to ensure that the police and the military were able to eliminate the real bad hats amongst the wider population of innocents. Intelligence was uh, very critical. A special Branch is tasked with collecting intelligence. Without good intelligence, you will never be able to look for the enemy and plan and defeat the enemy. Templar orders Special Branch to target the communist leadership. They must decapitate the insurgent forces. The sources of information would be, of course, agents and informers, which a Special Branch would use, and also the analysis of captured communist documents. And slowly and slowly from that sort of information, they would build up um, the hierarchical structure of the Communist Party from the very beginning, one by one. For Special Branch, nothing is off limits. You knew absolutely everything about the person, what his habits were, did he smoke, what, what his sex life was like, who his girlfriends were, everything we could possibly think of. In this intelligence war, the perilous task of gathering information will fall to Asian officers. They must be the eyes and ears of Special Branch. White Europeans will be the backroom boys. It was not possible for them to go down on the ground. They would stick out like a sort of time. So the brunt of collecting intelligence and working on the ground rested with the Chinese officers. As the saying goes, you need a thief to catch a thief. Special Branch launched their campaign by striking Chin Peng's all-important communications network. Communist couriers, usually on bicycles, crisscross Malaya, carrying messages from one remote fighting unit to another, often located hundreds of miles away. Chin Peng uses this jungle network to coordinate attacks all over Malaya. The Communist Party of Malaya has used couriers in the jungle. They operated from one unit to another, carrying messages, and there'd be jungle letterboxes where they deposit those messages to be picked up later on by the, the second leg of the courier trail. The couriers transmit a vast quantity of secret information. Messages are often written in tiny Chinese characters on rolled up paper slips, which usually require a magnifying glass to read. Messages are usually uh, rolled up very finely Sometimes so fine that uh, it's the size of a toothpick only. The communist couriers hide their messages in fruit or a tube of toothpaste or on their bicycles. Gulung halus halus. Halus halus gulung. Masuk dalam itu bersikar di lubang. Cuba lah hantar lah. Sampai sana, kita ada asarat pula. Special branch officers realize that if they can break this network, they will access a rich source of data and, they hope, cripple the communist fighting machine. Language skills are essential, and British police officers like Gus Fletcher are sent on crash courses in Chinese. It was a very tough course because it was one teacher, one pupil throughout the course. You couldn't sit at the back of the class and doze off. A Confucian monk taught us. He couldn't speak a word of English. Lovely old man. Lei Ying Hong, who wore a gown and hands in his sleeves and little cloth shoes and little cloth skirt and a Confucian beard down to here. <laughs> Lovely. To tap into the courier system, special branch officers must turn the couriers. In other words, persuade them to come over to the government side, along with their precious messages. Our penetration of the courier system was very good. And once the couriers have been turned, special branch agents can use them to track down the communist hideouts. 
And when the courier surrendered, it was, it was a good thing. He would take it to the camp and then you could attack it. Special Branch's success in breaching the communist courier system was all down to basic human greed. You surrender, especially when you come out with your arms, you get a reward for surrendering and an additional reward for bringing out the arms, depending on which arms. In the early 1950s, the Korean War pushes up the price of tin and rubber, making the Malayan government richer. And because the reward system is proving so effective, High Commissioner Templar can triple the money on offer. Top prize, communist leader Chin Peng. Templar sets his price at a quarter of a million dollars. Some feel queasy about the system, but no one disputes that it works very well. And it wasn't just the humble couriers who start taking money. Many communist fighters, exhausted by years of hardship, begin to sell out their comrades. Those communists who couldn't resist such enticements would then be pumped for information by special branch interrogators like Leon Comba. They often used to listen or take part in interrogation of those people. And once they'd settled down and they'd had coffee and they saw that they weren't going to be beaten up, um, they were quite happy to reveal tremendous amount of information about their comrades and what they'd been doing and, and about the location of communist camps and the location of courier routes through the jungle. Depending on the information he or she supplies to us, if they produce results, then the payment is dependent on the ranks of those we either capture or we kill. Now, captures normally, the reward is double than that of a kill because a live body is more important to us than a dead body. Rewards are not the only weapon in the British arsenal. The Malayan emergency is also a battle of ideas, so an ambitious propaganda campaign is devised. The British shrewdly turn to a Chinese Malayan who knows the enemy mind inside out. His name is CC2. Like Chin Peng, he has been schooled by the British in the black arts of psychological warfare, or PSYOPs. CC2 is a very interesting guy because uh, he had both an English and a Chinese education. He had learned the principles of psychological warfare from the British, but uh, he had something the British did not have, a good understanding of the uh, language and a good understanding of how the communist mind worked because he knew them very well. He almost joined them. He knew how they thought. By now, the Royal Air Force is playing a crucial role in Britain's war on terror. So propaganda mastermind CC2 prints millions of propaganda leaflets and launches an aerial paper barrage deep inside Chin Peng's jungle strongholds. Whenever a communist leader is persuaded to give himself up, the aircraft return, equipped with loudspeakers to spread the news. Your leader has surrendered. Why are you still in the jungle? But the hardcore communist leadership are not impressed. The RAF does not only drop paper leaflets. Special Branch coordinate devastating bombing raids aimed at the insurgents' jungle camps. The bomber pilots need to pinpoint their targets as accurately as possible. And in Malaya's immense jungles, this is no easy task. Special Branch come up with an ingenious high-tech solution. 
In their jungle camps, Chin Peng's fighters rely on radios to listen in to the worldwide communist networks. But if they need new batteries or a set repaired, they must come down to the towns. By setting up a network of informants, Special Branch manages to get hold of a few communist radios and secretly insert their own special gift. When they asked for a wireless set, we would get hold of our people in Kiel, put a little a false valve into it, which gave a signal. We'd alert the aeroplanes, and we'd take a signal flying over. Then we'd have a ground vehicle, which would do it from the ground as well. Where they crossed, that was where the wireless was being played. We could then bomb. The radio raid is a spectacular success. When I went in um, afterwards, and one man escaped. I, I found him sitting by the river, completely demoralized, and all those bombs, bombs, noise, and uh, they had a terrible time. As Special Branch steadily builds up its intelligence networks, their operations begin to chip away at the communist leadership, sometimes with macabre results. On one memorable occasion, three communists flag down a train and demand to be taken to the nearest police station. Tim Hatton is alerted and rushes to meet the party. He is in for a nasty surprise. And so we drove out to a a little shed I knew in, in the middle of nowhere, which I used as a sort of safe house. Then the leader of the party produced his pack, a big green pack, and dumped it on the table. And um, I said, what's that? He said, it's a captain. I said, it's a captain? And I looked more closely at it, and I could see black strings of hair coming round all over it, and bits of blood on the side. And I said, it's a human head. The um, bodyguard to the captain lifted up by its hair. And there, there was our cook, Central Committee member of the Communist Party, grinning at me. His eyes were open. Looking straight at him is a prize catch. Our cook was one of the Communist top five. His bodyguards had spotted a leaflet offering a massive reward for their boss, dead or alive. It was a temptation impossible to resist. Our Cook's betrayers deliver another prize, a document setting out Chin Peng's five-year plan. It tells a dramatic story, proving the Templars' efforts are beginning to pay off. Harassed by RAF bombers, army assault, and undermined by a succession of betrayals, Chin Peng has made a decision to flee. The architect of the insurgency is on the run but he has not given up. He plans to set up a new base in southern Thailand from where he will direct the campaign. And deep inside the Malayan jungles, the communists have set up new attack units recruited from indigenous tribal people. They must be Templar's next target.